Kelvin, Gerard, and Rockport, and I really appreciate that. Uh, and the county here in uh, Bear County, well, for those individuals who may be on the part of the country, refer to it as the Xar County, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Judy is absolutely no stranger to this particular uh, building, this particular entity, in San Antonio Education Partnership, because she served as executive director of the partnership, she served as the board of directors for the partnership, and frankly, she is serving the board of directors for private, private and public high schools in the San Antonio area. And this is all in top of her career, a three-year career in uh, USAA uh, credit union uh, in banking. So we're very pleased to have, again, two private sector entities who are now very much spending their time in the public sector and helping us think through uh, that entities who are very much involved in the Thank you, Jacob. Hi, everybody. <laughs> really excited to be here in San Antonio today. I've uh, just heard so many wonderful things through my colleagues uh, that have worked with many of you all through the San Antonio CAN effort. And I know that this is such an amazing city that has uh, really brought together just some wonderful resources, talent, and energy and momentum around where the city can go as a community. And so, I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to come out and speak with you all today. Um, as Jacob mentioned, uh, uh, our organization, Educate Texas, is a public-private partnership that was formed nearly nine years ago uh, with the state education agency, the governor's office, and some philanthropic support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Michael and Susan Bell Foundation, and uh, our housing organization, Communities Foundation of Texas. You all probably recognize a lot of the work that we used to do within the Texas High School pro Project portfolio of our STEM and early college high school work, as well as some of the support that we led across the turnaround practices. Well, over the last couple of years, you know, we clearly have built out a really robust network of partners and um, supporters across the state. And while we have done really great good for close to 150,000 students across our state of Texas, that is still a small percentage of the overall state student population. And so two years ago, when I came into this role um, at Educate Texas, we revisited the strategies and the plans that we wanted to take forward to really try and drive um, greater success and impact across the state because we know that our demographics are changing across the state. We know that resources are constricting, but we know that achievement and outcomes still need to accelerate and, and grow. And so we really um, did some good sort of internal reflection and research on the things that were happening across the state and across the country. And we ended up realizing that, you know, while we were fortunate to have had this opportunity to work across the entire state, you know, from El Paso to Texarkana, from uh, the Panhandle down to Brownsville, you know, we knew that one organization couldn't create the kind of critical mass and the kinds of changes that needed to happen across the systems to be able to affect the change at a fast enough pace. And so we did some research and started to understand the focus of looking at our work at a regional level or at a community level. <coughs> we started to understand that so many of our students end up not only going through the public education system in one region, but then they end up going into their higher ed uh, experience in the same region. So depending on where you are across the state, 65 to 85% of the students that are in the public ed system stay in the higher ed system within that same geographic program. And so if we were really trying to make some big changes across the state, we needed to start looking at this at a uh, community or region-based level. And so over the past year and a half, you know, I've become a big student and fan of this work that's happening called Collective Impact. And so how many of y'all have heard of Collective Impact? The word gets thrown around a lot, right? Everybody, you know, has been talking about it. They've been saying, you know, this is the, you know, great, uh, great solution for all of our social ills. And, you know, while I think there is some potential and some merit to the possibility of that, 
I think we're still at the early stages of really seeing whether or not this has that kind of transformative impact that we want to see. But at the same time, we know that what we've been doing over the past you know, 15, 25 years, you know, we've seen greater levels of investment and some marginal growth in productivity and, and outcomes. And so we know that we may need to look at some alternative ways of helping bring together all of these great ideas and practices and innovations to become more consistently embedded across the community, across the region. And so when I read this article about collective impact in the Stanford Social Innovation Review uh, 18 months ago, you know, a light bulb clicked for me. And what they were talking about was not something that was um, you know, earth shattering and some outrageous, crazy innovation or innovative idea. This was about you know, using common measures of um, understanding where we want to go as a community. So setting out, you know, what we talked through here. You know, what is the you know, sort of common vision for where we want to go as a community? What are the goals that we want to set for ourselves? How do we want to start measuring? our ability to achieve those, those goals and those targets? How do we start to understand the successes that we're seeing and accelerate and <coughs> enable those uh, practices to continue to flourish? And then how do we start to learn from the areas that have not been as productive and the areas that have not been producing the kind of results that we want to see? And then ultimately, how do you then you know, sort of orchestrate and bring together all of these different players across the community who have in many cases, you know, had the right intentions, but had not had the opportunity to come together and and really try to do that transformative change that we all want to see for our students and our community. And so, over the last 18 months, not only have I been a student, but I've been a practitioner of it. You know, I, I actually have embedded this into my everyday life. Um, you know, I picked up running uh, this this fall, and so I ended up, you know working out with my brother-in-law who's out in New York and he ended up you know said we set this goal you know in July uh, when we were vacationing together and he said oh you know it looks like we can run seven miles well let's set a bigger goal for ourselves let's set the common vision of where we want to go and so we set the target as being able to complete a half marathon and so that was the, the common agenda that we've established for ourselves then, you know, over the next three months, we ended up having a process where we were training, we were trying to measure, you know, our progress towards getting to that end point. And, you know, he had said, oh, I want to use my, Nike, my Nike app to track how I'm running. And well, I said, I want to use my Map My Run app, my Map My Run application to track how I'm running. We, we needed to set ourselves on a common measurement system. And so we used the same uh, application to start measuring our progress. And then, you know, as we went through our first month, you know, I was doing okay, he was doing far better. <laughs> Four years younger, six foot one, you know, far better shape. And so I started to learn from him, you know, well, what are you doing in terms of your diet? How are you training? What are some things that you're learning about, you know, stretching and pacing yourself? Because this was both of our first runs through um, an experience like this. So we had that opportunity to sort of learn from one another and <coughs> utilize the practices that we were putting into play. And then lastly, um, uh, there are two other parts. The communication piece. So clearly, you know, as he was outpacing me, there was a lot of trash talking that was going on. And <laughs> clearly that was upsetting to me. And it was good though, because we had that dialogue. You know, we had the communication between each other. And then the last part of what we'll be talking about from a collective impact perspective is a backbone. So how do you have a reinforcing structure that is there to help keep everybody on the same track, on the same path, day after day, week after week. And so I fortunately have a wonderful wife that is my backbone. <laughs> and so, you know, she gets a little, uh, uh, you know, George, you gotta get out of this education speak in, at home. We don't need to do that at home. Let's just talk normally again. You know, it sometimes happens, but you know, this has become something that has been um, something that has been really important to me. And so, I've been fortunate to have um, engaged with um, FSG Social Impact Partners, who 
were the original authors of this work. And one of the big collective impact organizations that they ended up highlighting in that initial Stanford Social Innovation Review article was a group called STRIVE out of Cincinnati. And I've been able to have opportunities to work really closely with Jeff Edmondson, who was the original you know, sort of designer and implementer of this work in Cincinnati for four and a half years. And so I've had that opportunity to really you know, sort of dig in and pick the brains of the folks that have been uh, not only leading and implementing this work, but then also the organization that has been trying to codify it so that other cities across the state and across the country can start to implement this. And so I want to um, sort of just give a quick um, Cliff Notes version. I know we don't try and do that in education, but uh, given the time that we have, I've got just a few um, slides that I wanted to highlight. So I think over um, over time, you know, we probably started out a lot, you know, sort of at this bottom level around um, isolated impact. And, you know, I think a lot of us have been doing really great and innovative and high impact things, but I don't think that they have been well coordinated, well aligned, well communicated to help advance the progress of the community. We've seen success on an individual level, on an individual organization level, but we've not brought those resources and those learnings to drive and accelerate the success of what we see across not just one district or two districts or three districts, but potentially an entire community or across an entire system of public education, higher education, the workforce consistently. And so I think there's an evolution and there are then, you know, sort of aligned impact efforts where, you know, we start using some common language around how we want to you know, sort of target what we want to go after. Sometimes we have comparable data systems that enable us to look at the comparisons across our organizations in a um, really uh, familiar and uh, identical way, but in many cases that doesn't happen consistently. And so the ability to translate the success that I'm seeing versus the success that someone else is seeing, you know, in a school or a district down the road, often doesn't get communicated and shared across that community system. And so then, you know, the direction and role of where we think this can go is really around what we've been talking about today, this idea of collective impact. So if we start with a common goal of building a college and career culture within all of our schools across the public end, across K-12 or pre-K-12, and we know that the goal is to get to 85% of our students who are college ready in the next eight years. And then we can then start to dig into some strategies that we're all testing and we're learning from, but we're embedded into common metrics that we're capturing across all four of these districts. We'll have that opportunity one year, two year, three years down the road to be able to make that comparison and say, the work that's happening in Carlindale clearly has demonstrated you know, significant growth and progress. And you know, the practices that we've tried over at Northwest you know, or Northside have not had necessarily the same level of success. But what is it that we're learning from Carlindale that we can port over to the learning and the progress that needs to happen at Northside? And so that's really the you know, sort of utopian world of where we're going. And I think you know, today's conversation in that last hour that we you know, ran through was a great demonstration of how this starts to come together. You, know, you all had spent the better half of the day you know, together talking about where you all wanted to go. You sort of voted with your uh, stickers and you talked about where you thought there were commonalities. Well, if we can start to agree on those areas and then start to be methodical about capturing the progress that we're seeing consistently across each of these different strategies that we're trying, we have an opportunity to really help highlight the successes that are happening and continue to push those efforts forward and then start to think about how do we better allocate our other resources and that are producing as well to those practices. And so that's 
collect an impact, you know, on a, a real quick snapshot. Now, how does this actually take place? You know, there are some practices and some principles that Strive and FSG have highlighted as sort of the core elements of a collective impact community. <coughs> The first one is what we talked about, setting that common agenda, knowing that I, my brother-in-law and I wanted to finish a half marathon, that we across these four districts want to create a college and career mode culture. You know, that is the common agenda, right? We know that that is where we want to go. Now, one level below that is then, what is the metric? What, what are we targeting across these four districts that are so critical to where we want to go as a community? And so y'all have done a really wonderful job of you know, having great leadership within the district, across the city, across your partners, to be able to get to something that you know, we can all say, that's where we want to be in the next eight years. Yeah, it may change a little bit, I think, but 85%, and that's the, that's the target at the end of our, our efforts. The second part is then the shared measurement piece. And I'm talking about how do we create consistent ways for us to evaluate the efforts that we're all leading in a way that are consistent with one another as we come back together? Elizabeth, you highlighted this. You know, we're saying Patrick is the one guy, you know, or this is the one initiative that's going to help bring us all together. Well, how do we end up leveraging all of the learning that's happening at the district? <laughs> to then be able to come back together and say, you know, what I'm learning on this practice is comparable to the comparison point that we're <coughs> trying out in this other district. And that we need to be able to come together across a common sort of measurement system that we can start to utilize to evaluate our programs across the community. The third part, you know, mutually reinforcing activities. This is the sort of continuous improvement cycle that we all need to be leaning on. Now, how do we continue to not prove that our practices are better than another district or prove that another, prove that a, a, a partner's practices are better than another partner's practices? But how do we end up learning from each other? How do we refine and enhance the work that we're doing individually <coughs> based on the collective knowledge of our partners across the community? So that's the sort of continuous improvement cycle. The next piece is really then the communication strand. So how do we ensure that we have a safe environment where we can come together and think about bringing together you know, not just practitioners in the public education space, but the business community, the civic leadership, the nonprofit organizations that we're partnering with in this goal to create a career and college going culture. Yeah, how do we create a safe uh, environment that enables us to have those open and honest dialogues around what's working, what are the drivers of those success, what are the things that aren't working, and what are we learning from those that we can then utilize to enhance what we have. And then the last element of this is then creating a backbone organization having somebody that has that objective, independent, we're doing what we're doing because we know we need to do this for our community, not just for one organization, not for one community, but for the collective group as a whole. And so this is one of the uh, most critical aspects from what I've seen over the last uh, 18 months in building out these efforts. Uh, in Dallas and in the Rio Grande Valley, that the backbone organization is one of the most critical components to seeing the kind of success that we all want to see happen through initiatives <coughs> like the department. So I'll stop right there and see if there are any questions that you all may have. Yes? Does PowerPoint be available for this slide? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 this process, and you know, I've learned both through uh, seeing this from the you know, people that have created this, but then also through my own participation in our Dallas effort. 
is not the linear, clean, you know, uh, logical path to get there. It's a hot mess. I mean, this stuff is never easy. You know, the fact that there are organizations that have had so much history, so much um, uh, success in what they've done for so long, you know, they've operated on their own track for a really long while. And they continue to get um, supported, they continue to do great things. But we know that you know, our students you know, need even greater supports and they need even greater resources to be at the level that we want them to be at. And so this process of helping bring those tracks together and align those efforts is, is a challenging one because there's territory, there's history, there's legacy, there's resources, real dollar resources that come into play around this conversation. And so it is a um, process that is challenging, but I think it is a really powerful platform for where we need to go as a, as a culture and as a community. Okay. Another hard question, bro. When is the half marathon? <laughs> well, I completed it, and uh, I'll just say the tortoise and the hare story is alive. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm happy to be a tortoise. Um, so, you know, what, what's happening with this collective impact work is something that is actually huge, right? I mean, uh, the whole idea of bringing together all of these different stakeholders across the community to define a common agenda, to set the measurement, to be able to talk about the progress that they're seeing and the progress that they're not, to have the open communication and support. You know, this is not something that is, um, you know, just in five cities now. Yeah, you know, Judy and I were up in Milwaukee with Alma um, in, um, in October, and there were 70 communities across the country, and eight countries globally that participated in this national convening of this concept called collective impact. And it is something that I think is catching um, so much attention and so much enthusiasm because of all of these, and you know, sort of, it's really the perfect storm, right? The desire to continue to grow and see success and accelerated outcomes, but with the shift and demographics and constricting of resources and dollars that are in play. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for San Antonio, who has been doing a lot of this work, to really start to come together and, and you know, utilize some of these principles. And so just to give you um, some lesson learned, you know, I know, Elizabeth, you really love the idea of wanting to be able to have some quick wins, and that is absolutely valid. But I think at the same time, this process of building relationships and building the kind of trust that needs to happen across communities is something that takes time. You know, we've seen, you know, in Dallas, you know, we had a couple of false starts in this process. And I think it took us a little bit of time to you know, sort of reset ourselves and get back out there. But I think we have come out of this stronger as a result of, you know, sort of taking that first step and realizing it was far too aggressive, and then pulling back and resetting uh, the timeline to then be able to go back and, and be successful. Second part, um, you know, from a timing perspective, you know, what you guys did in uh, 36 hours is a great starting point, but it's just the beginning, right? This is the tip of the iceberg. You know, in the Rio Grande Valley, the work that Alma and our team has led uh, with 12 superintendents and five higher ed presidents. You know, we've been able to help shorten the cycle time to be about six to seven months to be able to come together and align ourselves against that common goal and measures. The data systems that we're going to start putting in place, the uh, opportunity to have that open dialogue. In Dallas, it has been on that far end. It has been 18 months. We've had this conversation, you know, amongst a small, intimate group but it is now at the point where we're now seeing greater traction and greater uh, likelihood for success because we took the time to make that happen. Speed versus inclusion, again, this is, I think, another piece that's tied into this. You know, we all want to be able to start utilizing these convenings and these opportunities to see great success immediately. 
and then at the same time we also you know, think about well, how many different groups do we need to participate how many different stakeholders do we need to have at the table. But what we're seeing is that you know, if we get to a smaller, you know, more reasonable sized group like four districts, there's actually a lot of progress that can be made amongst that small intimate team in a faster way than having this be a much larger you know, uh, effort where we include many more organizations, many more districts, many more higher ed institutions, many more stakeholders. Facilitation, the ability to have an external party be a part of this dialogue, I think is really important. It goes back to that backbone. You know, having somebody that doesn't have a uh, stake or uh, a stake in you know, how this plays out, but is all about bringing together the different players that is there to help align the resources, the data, and be the sort of honest broker of this process is really important because we know that you know there are often times where we have you know, our own um, self-interest in mind, right? And that's hard to you know, sort of check your hat at the door when you come into these conversations. But having a third-party independent you know, sort of group to be able to be that objective party is really important, and it has I think helped a lot in the world that's happened that we've seen in Dallas and in the Rio Valley. And then lastly, you know, this process is really fluid and dynamic. You know, what we talked about today and over the last 36 hours around what we had said, this is, you know, this is the plan, this is the model, this is the approach that we're gonna take. You know, we may come back, you know, after we've all thought about this, you know, in our next meeting and realize that there actually may be a shift and we may be pivoting and uh, course correcting because we've learned something new or we've heard about a different approach or a different practice that we think has great merit and potential to do this work. And so as I was listening to um, you guys, you know, sort of brainstorm the menu of strategies, one, one of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, we know that this is the primary metric that we're targeting, 85% of our students being college and career ready. You know, how are these five strategies, and really this is part of the you know, sort of brainstorming process, how are these five strategies delivering clear outcomes that will help you get to this data? And we may realize you know, that investigating a career in college ready matrix, while it's a really wonderful idea, may not be the most effective and efficient way to help prop us up to get to that part. And so it's okay that, you know, we started out here by saying that that was one area that we wanted to prove out, but we do need to be able to have some data points that enable us to capture whether or not, you know, this is contributing as much to this end goal that we're talking about, or if we redirect the dollars towards for guidance and exploration, could be more meaningful, more impactful, and have even greater likelihood for us to see that end goal uh, materialize and happen. And so, I think you know this is a fun process to be a part of because you guys are doing some you know, sort of great groundbreaking things for this community that hopefully you know, can be a model and an example of how other parts of San Antonio and Bexar County can uh, uh, start to you know, flourish, right? And you guys can be champions of this work after the you know, first six months, the first 12 months of going through this work. And so I'm not going to go through the next couple of pages because you'll see them in the document that will be posted wherever it is. But you know, here are some examples of this work in Dallas. And the Rio Grande, Dallas is you know, 18 months into it. I think we're uh, much further ahead um, than where the valley was because we just started that six months ago. But the valley has you know, quickly picked up the pace. And I think you know, through the shared anointing of what we gained in Dallas and now are reporting down to the valley, you know, I think we're shortening the cycle time to be able to see the kinds of successes that we want to see in just the sort of design and framing of what the structure and so I'll pass it over to Judy because I know she's been 
really one of um, many that have been so tightly woven into all of the different things that have been happening in San Antonio. So go walk through the next areas of how this is helping you. Okay. The P16 uses the collective impact model. We're actually an emerging stride organization. What that means is that we're in the process, just like Dallas, just like several others, of, of how do I get to be a grown-up, cradle-to-career, sanctioned organization. And there are lots of things you have to do to accomplish that, and I'll kind of go through some of them. We are, we are trying to measure things that are common, and they're commonly understood by our community. Let me, I'm more of an example person. So the example is that I worked with our council on the definition of graduation rates and the definition of completion rates. And yes, the state has all these definitions, but everybody has to kind of be on the same page on what is it you want to measure. So we all agreed on the four-year graduation rate and the completion rate, <coughs> one, which is in, it, that comes from the TEA. So that's back to what did we agree on? We agreed that we get the data from TEA, we agreed about the definitions, and we keep track of that. And then I have the part of the P16's charge is to have data. So we have multiple, multiple years of data so that we can see trends. And some of the things in data that we um, provide are uh, we are working on a, a common kindergarten readiness point. We are working with United Way on the early developmental indicator where we're investigating and assessing <coughs> our kindergartners in Harlandale. San Antonio and Edgewood, and this year we'll be adding Northside. Why is that important? Because we'll have a common number and assessment in five factors for over 10,000 kindergartners. Now when you have a common measure, we'll say, are kindergartners ready or not? So we'll actually have one. And right now we don't have anything in common. Uh, the first grade reading score is the Texas primary reading. We have that, Lloyd Potter is gonna be getting that from the schools. And so that's the measure we'll use for that. Third grade reading and math proficiency, we track that. So you'll see a lot of these common measures all tie to the SA 2020 goals, right? The kindergarten readiness. Uh, we want to have our third graders reading on grade level or proficient. Well, how are we doing? So we've gone back and gotten the data, and, and now we can look at trends and start to dissect what that is. Also, help scale practices proven by data. Periodically convene educators and share data. Evaluate data on the practice by nonprofits and assist in scaling what works. My example of this is we're working with three school districts, now seven school districts this year, but let me tell you what happened last year. We worked with three school districts. We identified 12 elementary schools, and we were focusing on how do we get third grade reading better? in those schools. And so we dissected what we thought would work and we identified chronic non-attending children. Because if they're not in school, they're not learning to read. So we worked on a process, we trained, we, we commonly, P16 kind of was the backbone organization, but it was the school that was actually being trained, the people going to the houses and talking to parents. Why I know collective impact works is because when we did that, and we tracked the data, and we analyzed the data, we came up with some findings. By improving our contacts with the parents and finding out what was causing the reason why they weren't going to school, their attendance for those, non, those chronically non-attendance children went up 50% within five months because they contacted them, they found out what the issue was, and we laser focused, and you know, if you talk to parents, Oh, you're paying attention. You know my name. I mean, there's some other things that go along with that. So this year, we're trying it. With 30 elementary schools in seven school districts, collecting the data to see if what we learned in those 12 schools can be scaled. Once we figure out the data from the, the 30 schools, we'll go in front of all the 15 superintendents with Dr. Wood's help and everybody else that will help us get on the agenda and say, this is what we found out. This is how much it improved. This is what we did. Is this something we can scale to all 15 school districts? How much did that cost? Absolutely nothing. 
except the cost of the backbone, which was to call the meetings, to work on the process, the time in the schools, they were contacting parents anyway, usually with letters, good letters, second letters, third letters, then a phone call, and then the assistant principal or the principal would call. So it's just changing a process. But I know it works because you don't get a 5% improvement, you get a 50% improvement. So that's because you're all working together. The other thing is, is to advocate there for the entire community. Um, looking at amending policies to improve education system effectiveness. That's why we're working with Region 20 on Avatar and we're working on other things because we know if we can fix help with algebra, we can fix with aligning some of those things. It helps all of our school districts. It moves everything faster for students. And then communicating to, uh, to their community because we've only been using this model in P16 for less, about a year now, less than a year. This will be our first time we're going to go out with an annual report or a progress <coughs> report of what we've learned, what we measured, kind of a baseline. This is what we know about Bear County, and then we'll have like three years' worth of data. Third grade reading, uh, graduation rates, uh, retention rates. What's the cost of retention <coughs> for students? Kindergarten through third grade. We know that. We also know there are school districts that have saved over $2 million because they've improved their retention rates in the last in the last year. Over two million dollars because they've done a better job. So sometimes it's getting out the good work of all that what school districts are doing very well. Not always what we need to improve on. The other issue is is you've always said, well, how many of these collective impact models are there? Well right now in San Antonio, I'm aware of three. There is the East Side Promise neighborhood, there's Diplomas, and there's P16 Plus. And so my point is, you can all use the same model, but how are we the same and how are we different? East Side Promise neighborhood looks at one neighborhood. It actually has a cluster of schools in one school district, SAISD. Look over Diplomas. Diplomas is going to be in San Antonio, but with four ISDs and two higher ed, basically Elmo Colleges and UTSA to start because that's what the charge was for the diplomas uh, initial project. P16 plus, we do the whole county, a region, for the regional P16 for the state for this area. We um, are the, the SA2020 lead education person group because what do we do? We convene, we provide data. We facilitate. That's my whole mission. My, my, I don't have another mission. Diplomas is a piece of it. It has a backbone that's the partnership. Eastside Promise Neighborhood is a program within United Way, but it's huge. It's huge, and it's using that model. We're a STRIVE organization. That's our only mission in life, is to, to facilitate, be Switzerland, look for money, do, you know, be a hot mess. Most of the time, you know. But the other thing we have to realize is that we all work together in San Antonio. Leadership on all three groups are cross-pollinated. We have the head of United Way, the CEO of United Way, Howard Nolan, on the council. We have our superintendents that are involved in all these, many of which are on our council, which are on diplomas, which are helping these side. So by having a few leaders that are across all the versions, we align so we don't duplicate things. For instance, P16 Plus is working on three-year-olds to eight-year-olds. Even though I'm assisting diplomas, I'm working on, I'm on the advisory council for Eastside Promise Neighborhood, I help with a lot of things that are going on in town because I really need to do that because I'm 3K through 34 years old, people that have grown up. But the issue is, what am I deep diving on? I'm deep diving on three-year-olds to eight-year-olds because I can't work on everything unless somebody wants to give me a whole bunch of things. But, but the issue for me is that we are the same model. We just have different focuses. Mine's, the P16 is a regional focus. The other one is the alignment of all three collaborative. Think of how we can scale this by working together. And how can we sustain this? We have to find a way, if we find something really good, we need to work with our school districts and work with our colleges and universities. Because ultimately, if you have an improvement in education, who's this, 
sustains this. And it's usually the institutions, the systems themselves, need to sustain with our help, with everyone's help. But our mission is simple. We want to ensure that every child dramatically improves their educational success in school, college, and career across their county. And then our vision is to convene, facilitate educational enhancing efforts to inspire and prepare our communities, families, and students for success. Those were things we all agreed on. It's just how we get to them is different. So when we look for funding, I'm looking for everything. I'm looking for funding like this doesn't work for me, but I'll send them over to East Side or vice versa, East Side Promise Neighborhood or Diploma. As we find a, a, a funder that's really interested in Latino specific things, we can send them to Diploma. Our goal is that we just make it work. Like in your when we were working, it's not about the credit, it's about the outcomes. So as long as we focus on outcomes, which we do, what is the what is the number? Well, our number we know is 85% for college readiness. We know that we want 50% of people 25 years and older to have something more than a high school education. We've all agreed on that as a community. So we're fortunate to have a mayor and a vision that we kind of as our North Star, and then all of us are kind of working toward those big outcomes. But we have lots of ways to get there. So my job as the ED and everybody that works for me is to how can we help you get there? You don't see me leading a whole lot of stuff because that's not my job. My job is to help you do your job or to get someone to help you do your job or to find money for you. So that is the difference and that is the same of, of what we do. So we're lucky. We have millions of dollars going in East Side Promise neighborhood. We have money coming from Lumina and soon others for diplomas. And P16 is out there looking for money too for the same goals. So that will be collective. Think of it. We're all moving toward the same place. And it's because of you. You do a fabulous job. You just don't hear it very often, but you do. You do a great, great job. And my job is to make sure people know that. San Antonio is getting better. Better in dropouts, work fewer dropouts, higher graduation rates. We have 154,000 people going to college. We do need some work, however. I'm persistent in college and getting college degrees. But I think our city has hope by the numbers. If you have over 150,000 people going to college, you know they have hope. They just need the tools to finish. Right? They need the skills to finish. That's what we've been talking about the last couple of days. So it's because of you. You guys do a great job. So I'm brief. I'm open for questions. I know George is too. Any questions? Um, thank you. Just a couple of, uh, as we start to wrap up, I'm going to wrap, wrap this up. Uh, when you walk out of here, just so that uh, we have a press conference at 1.30, so as we walk out of here, if you are the